Pastor Mike Robinson. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Pastor Mike Robinson. I'm senior pastor of Greater Ena Missionary Baptist Church. Welcome aboard. Thank you for joining us for our Monday edition of our National Prayer Line Fellowship. Um, we're going to start momentarily just to give a little time for people to log on and we'll get started. And again, God bless you and welcome to tonight's fellowship. Hey, Reverend Fred, how you doing, sir? We're going to get started in a few minutes. Just going to give it one more minute and we'll get started. Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Mike Robinson. Welcome aboard. Uh, this is our Monday edition of our six o'clock Bible and Prayer Fellowship. And I'm joined by my clergy partner, my big brother in ministry, Reverend Fred Robinson, Associate Pastor of Greater Enon Missionary Baptist Church. And uh, we thank you all for taking time out to give God a priority in your life. And so we don't uh, take this for granted that you're joining us tonight, and uh, we thank you for the fellowship. Uh, Reverend Fred Robinson, can you open us up in prayer, please? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, once again, you have allowed a few of your believing children to come into fellowship and to worship with you tonight on this prayer line. Thank you for what has already transpired during this day, how you have been with us all day long, how you have provided and protected us. And we give you thanks and we give you praise. And we do bless your name. We are not going to this time of reflection that you would be one in our midst that you will allow your spirit to reign supreme, that you will allow it to saturate everyone who will be on this prayer line, whether they'll be participating or just being ministered to, but to guide and protect us and, uh, and, 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 and allow one of your servants to give us what God has placed on his heart that we all have to hear benefit, benefit Good evening. from it. And we bind anything that will come against it. We bind it in the name and in the blood of Jesus. So have your way now. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. And the praises will be done forever. We ask it in the name of the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Reverend Fred Robinson. Amen. And uh, everybody turn to the Old Testament. On the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 22. The Old Testament, 1 Samuel, first book of Samuel, chapter 22. 1 Samuel chapter 22. 
I'm going to read uh, verses one and two. If somebody has it, uh, somebody read verse one and somebody read verse two for me. First Samuel's, first Samuel's chapter 22. Somebody read verse one and somebody read verse two. Amen, somebody. Um, so tonight, I want to talk about lessons learned from the cave of Adullam. Lessons learned from the cave of Adullam. The word Adullam means justice, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I want you to just hold that in the back of your mind. When we look at this story, it, it comes on the heels of chapter 21, when David was um, behind enemy lines and he was amongst uh, a king called Akash, A-C-H-I-S-H, A-C-H-I-S-H. And King Akash was an enemy of the children of Israel and Israel feared this king. And David was now in this uh, king's presence. And David, um, to protect his life, to protect his own life, he pretended to be insane. He started, uh, the Bible describes, uh, frothing at the mouth, allowing spit and saliva, if you will, to drip from his face. And he was clawing at the walls and screaming and just acting like a lunatic. And uh servants of the king pointed to the king and was like, is this David? Is this the one that, you know, killed tens of thousands? You know, and, and they were amazed at his insanity. And David faked the insanity so that he would not be killed by his enemy. And then right after that, the Bible tells us that David retreats to a cave called Adullam. And David's alone because he's being hunted by Saul, the king. David's not king at this time. And Saul has a bounty on David's head. He, he wants to kill David. Although David has been very faithful to Saul, Saul, within his own right, is somewhat crazy. He's crazy with jealousy. He's crazy with envy over David. And so even though David has been nothing but loyal to Saul, uh, Saul wants to kill David. And so David, all alone by himself, now is in this cave. And some of y'all can relate to this kind of experience where you've given your loyalty to someone. You've been faithful. You've been just. You've been supportive. You've been loving. You've been caring. You've been kind. And in return, you got spit in the face with treachery. You got spit in the face with deceit. The very people you've helped are the very ones that can hurt you the most. And so David, loyal to King Saul, even slain as a child, Goliath, the, the enemy of the children of Israel, you would think that Saul would be ever in debt to David. But David is now being hunted by Saul, and he's now alone. He's now alone in this cave. He's now alone. And then the text tells us that men hear about David's retreat to this cave. And then what's interesting, the Bible says that there were certain men that heard that David was in this cave. And so these other men decided to join David and retreat to this cave. And you may ask, well, why would these 400 men do so? Well, look what the Bible says about these 400 men in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 2. 
it said, and everyone that was in distress, these men were distressed, and I'll get to that in a minute. These men were um, in debt. That means they were in financial ruin. Financially, they were, you know, in debt way over their head. It says that every one of these men were discontented. When you look at the translation of that word discontented in its original Hebrew language, it literally means those men were bitter. They were discouraged about their failures in life. And so these 400 men who were distressed, stressed out of their mind, they were stressed with various adversities going on in their life where they just couldn't handle it anymore. These 400 men, it says, were in debt over their head. And back in biblical times, if you couldn't pay your debt, they would put you into slavery or they would put you in jail until you came up with the money you owed. And then it says that these 400 men were men that were discontented. And again, that word discontented means that they were bitter. They were awfully sad. They were awfully depressed uh, over their life. They weren't happy with their life. They had many failures. And it said that when they heard that David had retreated to this cave, they decided to do the same. And, and isn't it funny that misery loves what? Y'all finish it for me. Misery loves what? All right now. Amen. And so we see that now this cave, it had to be an enormous cave, y'all. And, and these men who were stressed out and couldn't handle life anymore, these men who are over their head in debt, who couldn't pay their debt and they didn't want to go into slavery and they didn't want to go to jail. And the men that were very bitter over their life, disappointed in their life choices, these 400 men decided we don't want to function in society and face consequences. So we're just going to retreat like this other guy did, this fallen leader who's no longer a leader in position that he once held. And we know that because it said in verse one, David therefore departed and escaped to the cave Abdullam. And when his brethren, that means these were fellow brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, fellow brothers of the faith who knew of David. These were fellow believers of God who've given up on life for various reasons. They were stressed out. They were in debt, weren't good stewards over their money, and they were discontented, the Bible says, which means they were very bitter people, weren't satisfied with their life choices. And so they decided we're going to go with this fallen leader into this cave. And so they're all in this cave. Now, I look at Abdullam, when I look at these two passages of scripture, I look at Abdullam as a place of retreat, a place of refuge, a place of rest, a place of rejuvenation, and a place of restorative justice. That's what I see in the text. When we look at the text, we see that broken men hear of David's residency in the cave of Adullam, and they gather with him. These were broken men, men that were distressed, men that were financially ruined, men that were hopeless because they were bitter over their life choices, discontented. And I shared with you that misery loves company. We have to be careful and not let our emotions in our life circumstances to dictate how we react. We should always be consistent in our faith. Whether we're going through good times or bad times, we should always be loving God. We should always be trusting God. We should always be going through hard times with our head up, knowing that we have hope in Christ and that the Bible tells us that um, 
the, the, that that the brothers and sisters are are seen by God and and God knows the very hairs on our head and that God has never forsaken his own so we can trust that God knows about our circumstances and that we can hold our head up and shoulders back knowing that God has the ability to turn things around. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy does come in the morning. And so, amen, amen. amen. we got to hold on to that. And so these men, these they were full of misery and they decided, well, if our leader is going to retreat and, 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 and tuck his tail between his legs and retreat in this cave, well, let's just join him. Not joining him in encouragement, but joining him in misery. It would be different if those 400 men who knew of David's triumphs, who knew of David's uh, uh, achievements, who knew of David's um, status, who was second in command with the king before the king turned on him. You would think that they would go in and encourage the man of God. But what do they do? They wallow in misery with him. They don't go to the cave to encourage him. They go to the cave to wallow in their misery, their collective misery. And, and what's interesting here is that here it is. The world may forsake you and I. The world may come at you and I from all angles. The world may want to kick us to the curb, but God is always faithful to his children. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. God loves us so much. I want y'all to hold on to the, I know y'all hear me say it all the time, but I'm saying it all the time so y'all can hear this message resonate in your heart during those times and during those seasons of life where life is kicking you in the gut, where life is kicking you when you're down so that you can resonate in your heart. What I'm telling you tonight, that God is always present in your life. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And because of that alone, God is able to turn your circumstance around. Hallelujah. 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 And though the world may be harsh when you're down, because if I'm in debt over my head, your debt collectors don't care that you got to put food on your table first before you pay them. The debt collectors don't care that you got children that you got to support before you pay them. They just want their money and they can be very cruel and tenacious about getting it. The world doesn't care that you're stressed out of your mind where you're in distress over death of friends and loved ones, distressed over complications in relationships, distressed over work situations. The world doesn't care. The world will kick you while you're down. The world doesn't care that you're discontented. The world doesn't care, here it is, that you're bitter over the bad life choices that you made. And sometimes you beat yourself up and sometimes you feel like you're not even worthy to be in society, that you're not worthy to lead a family, that you're not worthy to, to be on the job doing the things that you've been assigned to do, that you just don't feel worthy because of the bad choices and bad decision-making that you've made. The world will kick you while you're down. But understand, my friends, that God is our faith, that God is our hope, that God is our love. And as a result of that, all things are possible with God. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. Look, the cave of Abdullam, these 400 men that knew of David, if they, if they were in their right mind, those 400 men would have went to that cave to encourage that man. 
but because we sometimes allow our life circumstances and our life choices and the adversities that we're going through, whether it's distress, whether it's financial ruin, or whether it's discontentment, you pick your poison. Whatever the adversity is that can sometimes get us down in life, amen. Understand this, that the cave of Adullam isn't a place of residency. It is a place that is for rejuvenation. It is a place that is for rest. It is a place for restorative justice. It is a place for retreat, not a place of residency, but it is a place so that you can regroup, so you can come back stronger than you were before. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. 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 And I'm so glad, and I'm so glad that even though those 400 men didn't realize that David had the temerity, he had the spiritual stamina to realize that the cave wasn't a place of residency, but it was a place of retreat, a place of refuge, a place of rest, a place to rejuvenate, a place of restorative justice so that he can rebound stronger. Sometimes, watch this, y'all. I'm getting excited. Y'all better pray for pastor. Hey, hey, sister yeah. Regine Hutch Hutchins, good to have you on board with us. Regina Hutchins, you're watching us on, on YouTube Live. God bless you, sis. Sometimes when we're going through adversities, you know what? I get excited at how when I enter into adversity, I may be a little downtrodden. But when God brings me through, I look back over my life and I see how God carried me through and I start praising God. And then when I go through the next adversity, I just reflect on the fact that if he brought me through one storm, he can bring me through other storms. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, and so I get excited that even though the 400 didn't have the mindset that David had, David, at least as the leader, had the mindset that I'm not I'm not here to take up residence like you 400 guys. I'm here passing through. I'm just here to retreat a little bit, to find refuge and rest to rejuvenate, to come back stronger. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I'm reminded of Psalms chapter 46, verse 1. Somebody read that loud and proud. Psalms chapter 46, verse 1. Somebody give me that. Oh, I'm getting excited, y'all. Y'all better, better hold on and buckle up. Hallelujah. Somebody give me Psalms 46, verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And David understood that. That, that was an intimate word of God that David intimately embraced. That God is a refuge, a place where I can find safety. And God is our salvation. Hallelujah. He's a present help in time of trouble. And David knew that intimately. For the Bible tells us that even though David was a very flawed man, he was not perfect by no stretch of the imagination. But one thing, that the word of God says about David is that he was a man after God's own heart. And we all should have that testimony, my friends. We all should desire to be like David, to be men and women and children of God who are after God's heart. Amen. Hallelujah. And so David realized the cave of Adullam, I'm not taking residency here. This is, this is just the place I'm passing through. I don't know about y'all 400, but I'm just passing through. <laughs> so the next time you guys 
are going through stress, the next time y'all going through some financial troubles, the next time y'all are going through some bitterness because of some bad life choices, y'all just tell misery, I'm just passing through. My hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. I'm standing on the word of God. Hallelujah. Jesus is the rock of my salvation, my cornerstone, a way maker. He's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. He is my way maker. He is my joy. He is my salvation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I'm having me a praise party over here. I'm getting excited, y'all. I'm getting excited, y'all. So watch this. In good times... And especially, I want y'all to hear me, my friends, in good times and especially in bad times, we are to depend on God. In the good times, when everything's going my way, praise the Lord. In the bad times, when everything is falling apart, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 You know why, folks? Because God is my refuge. I can find safety in God. Mm -hmm. God is my rest. Amen. He says, I'll give you a peace that passeth all understanding. He says, watch this, that, that he will minister to us by the still waters. Amen. He gives us rest. God is a rejuvenator. When you receive Christ, you were born again. You got this zeal. You got this new spirit. You got this new way of living that rejuvenated you. Your life was quickened. Your spirit man was quickened. Where, where that sinner man was now, watch this, overpowered by the Holy Spirit, where now you are a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. You've been rejuvenated spiritually. You've been born again. Amen. Yes. And, yes. and the cave of Abdullah not only represents refuge, not only represents rest, not only represents rejuvenation, it also represents restorative justice because the word Abdullah literally means people's justice. And, and what does that have to do with what I'm talking about tonight? Well, I'm glad you guys asked. When you look at the next chapter, 1 Samuel's chapter 23, David and God are in prayer and conversation because that's what prayer is. It's a conversation with God. And God tells David, look, I need you to go beat up on the people, amen, of Keilah. Because I'm sorry, uh, not Keilah, the, the the Philistines who are beating up on the people of Keilah. Keilah were God's people, and, and 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 but they were being beat up on by one of the enemies of God, the Philistines. And God tells David, "I need you to leave this cave, and I want you to take these men, and I want you to go beat up on the Philistines to rescue the people of Keilah." And God says, you mean these guys, these cowards? Because the Bible, when you read uh, chapter 23 of 1 Samuels, the chapter literally tells you how the men respond. They was like, you mean you want us to fight the Philistines? They were scaredy cats. They were cowards. But then David ministered to them, and they said, well, if you say so, we're going to do it. If God called us to do it, we're going to do it. And they did what God said, and they conquered the Philistines. What am I trying to say? They came to their senses and realized this, this man of God who was once alone, who was once in this cave, who once had some defeats, who once was down, he's now up again in the Lord. So they remembered how God stood mighty with David and how David stood mighty with God. And now David is rejuvenated. He is restored. And here's the restorative justice piece. God restored David so that David would bring justice 
to the people of Kayla. And God asked David to bring those men forward and those men followed David into battle and they defeated the Philistines that were beating up on the people of Kayla who were believers in God. Oh man, God never fails us. You plus God are an army. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there anything too hard for our God? I beg to say no, my friends. All things are possible with our God. Hallelujah. So, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to bring to you guys tonight. I was so encouraged by just these two verses. If you read chapters 22 and chapters 23, just as a meditation to study. Oh my God. I know the word of God will encourage your heart because it because it certainly encouraged mine. But just those two passages of scripture alone, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 and 2, just those two scriptures alone are so powerfully encouraging. And I thank God through his Holy Spirit for ministering to me in, in, in a right season where I just needed to hear that. Amen, somebody. So the floor is now open for any questions, any comments, any prayers related to um, our uh, discussion, our Bible focus tonight. Um, the floor is now open. The prayer line is open. Is there one that has a comment, prayer, or uh, testimony? Yes, sir. That's my big brother, Reverend Fred Robinson, y'all. Okay. Number, number one. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when you're going through stressful situations, in other words, he is our, he is our, he is our, he is our peace. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, Rev. 
Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. 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 And, and and when you read that entire Psalms, when you read when when you read the entire Psalm uh, thirty four, it really speaks to seeking God. And remember, I said a um, uh, 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 moments ago that that David was a man after God's own heart. Psalms 34 is literally, when you read it, not only about encouragement, but it's about seeking God. Hallelujah. 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 There it is, bro. Whether I'm on the sunny side or whether it's raining on my parade, I'm going to bless God. Amen. 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 At all times. At all times. There it is. There it is. <laughs> no matter whether it's raining or the sun is shining, I'm going to praise you. Amen. Amen, Pastor. And, and then, then I'm going to let others know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. And and look how one man, look how one man's circumstance of being down and out, but trusting the Lord nonetheless, how that influenced the 400. Don't think that because you're alone. David was alone in that cave, but guess what? Because of his faithfulness and his loyalty to stay faithful to God, even in the midst of his great yeah. adversity, he influenced in a very powerful way those 400 men who had lost hope. Think about that the next time you think that you don't count to your family or you don't count on your job mm -hmm. or you don't count in ministry or you don't count in your community. Mm -hmm. David influenced those 400 men who contributed to the victorious defeat over God's enemies, the Philistines. One man did that. God used one man to change the hearts of 400. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, y'all, if I, if I feel like I'm a little too hyped up for some of you guys, but y'all just don't know how this thing ministered to me. Hallelujah. 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 Whoo! Hallelujah. 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 Whoo! Mm -hmm. Oh, I feel like I need to run around. I woo. Mm -hmm. woo, the anointing, the anointing, hallelujah, hallelujah. As a way of a testimony, I remember one time, you know, um, in my life that you no, know, I was in bankruptcy between jobs. I didn't know how my bills was going to get paid. You know, I didn't know where my next um, um, deal was going to come. I was sitting in the uh, house in the front room and you know, just like, what I'm going to do, guys? What I'm going to do? You know, what? What, what had me to go? I remember those days. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, heard in my other you know, voice that said, go to Jefferson. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Jeffrey. 
got the job. You know what I mean? So I was like, thank you, God. You know, that helped him. I had a job, but everything was just topsy turvy, upside down. You don't know. You know what? Hallelujah. And I heard a voice say, go to Jeff's office. Then Jeff's going to get hired. That's what I was going to I just thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God. Right back, been in those situations where we just know where our next meal was coming from, what our next, yeah. meal, you know, what to do in that situation. Thank God for the money. Hallelujah. I want y'all to write. I want y'all to write this down. I, I'm sorry, uh, Deacon Ray. I'm just saying, give God the glory. Amen, brother. Amen. I, I, I want y'all to write this down. I want y'all to write down um, Jeremiah 30, verse 17, and Jeremiah 31, verse 3. Now, as, as Deacon Ray just said a moment ago, how there was one period of his life, one season of his life, where he was going through some financial adversities and other adversities, but how his faith was strong and how God brought him through all of that. Now, 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 listen to this. When you look at Jeremiah uh, uh, 30, chapter 30, and Jeremiah uh, chapter 31, it speaks to restoration. How when we're down, how when we're out, how when we're distressed, when we're financially um, drowning, when we are bitter from bad life choices, how God can turn things around. The Bible teaches us that, look, the years that the canker worm and the locust have eaten away, God can restore that. God can bring back in an abundant way the things that the locusts and the canker worms of life have eaten away. Look at, look at uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 17. It says, for I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, this is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. God will not be mocked. God is not going to have his people out there begging bread. God is not going to have the enemies speak bad of him and his people. God is going to intervene when we cry out to him. God is going to intervene when we repent from our wicked ways and bad decision making and we come to God and we ask God to change us and rearrange us and to encourage our heart. And, and then when you look at um, Jeremiah chapter 31, another chapter that speaks to how God does restoration. Look at verse three of Jeremiah chapter 31, verse three. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me saying, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn thee. God will never leave us nor forsake us. God has an everlasting love for you and I. And you may not think you're worth loving, but God loves you. Your spouse, your relatives, your coworkers, your neighbors may have called you all sorts of horrible names and they may think lowly of you, but God, amen, somebody loves you so much that he is not going to see you forsaken. He is not going to see you down and out. God will prevail in your life. Amen, somebody. This was meant for somebody. This this was meant for somebody tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Especially for those, especially for those who've been faithful, but because of the great adversities they're going through, they're focused on the adversity and not the possibilities of God. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Hallelujah. I look yeah. upwards, y'all. Yeah. Just keep yeah. looking upwards. Yeah. As long as you can look up, I don't care how far down you are, as long as you can look up mm -hmm. from what's right. cometh your help. Amen. And our help Amen. comes from the Lord. 
Hallelujah. Yes, Hallelujah. Depend on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I, I got to end this. There it is, brother. Amen. Tell me the scripture, please. Yep, our uh, scripture. Oh, no problem. Our scripture tonight was First Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. And the title of our conversation tonight was Lessons Learned from the Cave of Adula. Yep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to um, in early tonight because I have a seven o'clock Zoom meeting. So I'm going to bow out. But if you guys want to continue in the fellowship, uh, Reverend Fred Robinson is on the line and uh, y'all can continue with the praise, the worship, the testimonials and the response to tonight's text. Uh, I want to thank all of you for allowing me uh, to share God's word with you tonight. And uh, I thank God for all of you. And I pray that his word was a blessing to you. God bless everybody.